The film that follows is about a real cave rescue call-out. All the scenes of rescue work below ground were shot during the actual operation and will be shown exactly as they happened. Some of the scenes on the surface were taken on other days. I was in the middle of putting together a video about the development of cave filming technique when I realised that in October this year, 2017, it will be 50 years after the filming of Sunday at Sunset Pot. Filming for television for the first time on this rather harrowing documentary started a remarkable series of events that was to launch me into a lifetime of making films about caves and caving. I consequently felt it was a story worth telling to mark the anniversary. Early in 1967, at the age of 30, I was working as an assistant sound recorder for the BBC Film Unit in Ealing Film Studios when I was called into the office. They knew that I'd been a keen caver for eight years and often chased up to the Yorkshire Dales when I had some time off and sometimes arrived back lacking sleep and with mud still in my hair. There was a proposal to make a film with the cave rescue organisation in Clapham. They were to do tests, would I like to go up and help advise where I could. The organisation has no glamour, but it does have a couple of Land Rovers and a trailer kept next door to the pub at Clapham. It can call on the local underground rescue team and 26 other teams from nearby towns. It can also call on 34 years' experience of getting people out of potholes. Its chief warden, Reg Hainsworth, is a poultry keeper. Who years I'd been caving in the Dales since the late 50s with the BSA, Mason Settle. So I knew Reg, and I was already familiar with the cave rescue organisation. Other leaders soon to be in action I'd also met Jim Leach and Butch Burgess, who had a business in Settle, and others like Brian Baldwin, who was a PE teacher at a local school. The cameraman for the tests was a sort of anamorphic version of Mike Harding, short and stout, a likeable Scottish camera assistant called Hamish, who it seems was the only volunteer. We were called to the film department workshop to inspect the equipment that the engineers had prepared for us. A car headlamp sealed beam unit was attached to the front of a safety helmet. It was to be powered by a 12 volt camera battery with the cells cased in a leather cartridge like belt. The intention was that a member of the rescue team would wear this on a real cave rescue while filming with a small 16mm camera. I realised immediately that there were some potential problems. The helmet was front heavy and tended to fall over Hamish's eyes. There was no provision for a caving light when the half hour duration filming light was switched off. Above all, the battery belt was too short for Hamish's rather generous waistline. As a sound man, I was given a token Emmy reel-to-reel tape recorder that was already obsolete and which, with batteries, weighed at least 10 pounds. We met up at the Cave Rescue headquarters in Clapham, or rather in the Hill Inn next door where we were all staying. There was Aubrey Singer, head of BBC Outside Broadcast. There was the managing director of BBC North Region. Representatives of Cave Rescue, including Reg Hainsworth, of course. There was Hamish, me, and my caving mate, Les Greenwood, who had badly sprained an ankle and was on crutches. We were to go that afternoon to do tests in Yorda's cave. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go, 
With a shovel and a pick and a walking stick. Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! It's off to work we go. With a shovel and a pick and a walking stick. Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! Hi ho! It's off to work we go. That evening, at the new inn, everybody was saying how good the equipment was, except me. I pointed out that Yorlis was in no way a typical caving situation, and that I predicted problems. I finally persuaded them that the following day we should try somewhere a little more demanding. I suggested Berkwith. Just inside the entrance, where the passage was a little under a metre high, I suggested we try a shot, for Hamish was already struggling. So Hamish finds out that once he's crouched down, the helmet is falling over his eyes even more. And then, when he tries to point the camera that way, the light's pointing that way. When he tries to point the camera that way, the light's pointing that way. He just can't win, and the sweat's pouring off him. And then suddenly, completely out of the blue, the batteries around his waist start exploding. They were retreated to the cars, looking glum. We've obviously got problems, Sid. Would you be interested by any chance in coming up and doing the filming? If I could arrange it, that is. The reply, of course, was yes. Then on the 24th of June, just as the project was getting underway, there was a huge incident in Yorkshire at Mostel Caverns. Five cavers that I knew had drowned in the worst caving accident in British history. As far as the BBC were concerned, it made the film even more relevant. As far as I was concerned, I knew that it made it very much a more sensitive subject. But Ealing, under my guidance, two new lighting sets were constructed. A 100 watt quartz halogen lamp was in a specially designed lamp unit. It was powered by silver zinc cells, housed in a robust case. In August I moved up to the Dales. Les and I were to be staying for the duration at the Crown in Horton in Ribblesdale while we waited for a suitable filmable rescue. We didn't object. We soon had a visit from producer Don Howarth and cameraman Gordon Entwistle. Don seemed a little intense but was one of BBC Manchester's top documentary film producers. We spent the day doing a few nice service shots and discussing the plan of action. This is the greenest part of the Pennines, the limestone country of the Yorkshire Dales, the land of running water. The streams disappear into a wonderful world below ground, the world of the caves, a maze of passages too narrow at some places for a man to crawl, opening out at others into chambers as large as a cathedral. All weekends, we would need to be on call for a rescue, but during the week we needed to film some introductory caving sequences, using what few cavers might be available. Gordon Entwistle could also come over from his home in Morecambe, as needed, to enable Les and I to make up the numbers. We soon learned that Gordon was game for anything. He was not a caver. He had no caving gear. We told him just to wear old woolens. He turned up in his wedding suit and finished up on the first shoot up to his neck in water. He didn't complain. 
On sequences like this, in the inlet passage to the Hull Point during the flood, there was only myself, Les on lights, and Gordon operating the camera. Caving was at a peak. On a Saturday night, the crown was full, and there was a lot of drinking and singing of bawdy songs. Don wanted to film it. He hired a local folk band and spread the word there was to be free beer. Guess what? It worked. The only problem was no free beer emerged other than those that were in shot who tweaked that they needed their glasses refilling for continuity. Shots over, Don departed, leaving me with about 48 half pint bottles of beer to distribute to about a hundred cavers. forecast was to prove optimistic before the day was done but the morning seemed safe enough for potholing and scores of parties of cavers were setting out for the fells two were making their way up the flank of Ingleborough to sunset pot 1250 feet above sea level and a mile and a half from the nearest road first four of the experienced gritstone club led by Roger Sutcliffe followed about two hours later by another group of four from Teesside, only one of whom, the leader, Raymond Dean, had ever before used ropes and ladders. With him were two brothers, Brian and Eric Luckhurst, who had both done a bit of simple caving, and Michael Stewart, who had never been down a pothole before. And this loud thump from back in the chamber, my immediate thought was that it could be an explosion, but thinking about it a bit more, it seemed more likely that it was something falling. So I came back to the chamber as quickly as I could and saw Raymond, uh, Eric Luckhurst rather, lying on the ground, partly in a pool of water. And Raymond Dean said he'd, he'd fallen off the ladder. Apparently, he'd been on a lifeline and uh, they'd arranged that before I started climbing, he would give three tugs to indicate to the party at the top that he was ready to climb. The sound of the water in the chamber was too loud to allow them to communicate by voice. And apparently he'd, uh, he'd fallen from near the top of the ladder and the two men on the right line at the top hadn't no one was climbing at all, and the lifeline had in fact been slack. Anyway, it was obvious he was hurt, and a quick examination showed me that he'd, uh, he'd broken his ribs, and there didn't appear to be much more damage than that, because he could move his legs, and he could talk and sit up. Obviously, he was going to need outside help, and so I told Raymond Dean to go on the pitch and send some of our party out to call out the CRO. It was about 4.30 when Leach and Burgess set out from Clapham. At the pothole ten miles away, Roger Sutcliffe had taken charge of the care of Eric Luckhurst. Down at the bottom of the pitch, what we had to do was to try and move Eric Luckhurst clear of the water and keep him warm and as dry as possible till the CRO arrived. 
and he was a very heavy lad, and so this was going to need four of us to move him at all. Raymond Dean and Eric's brother Brian and Michael Shude came down, and with four of us we managed to move him a few feet to a drier spot, and made him as comfortable as possible, and I suggested that the other lads built a bit of a wall around him to try and keep some of the spray off and then sit close alongside him to keep him warm. The first potential incident was a long time coming. By the time the rescue really got underway, Gordon had already arrived from Malcolm and was filming on the surface. Um, well, I'm just weighing up, up the situation. Hey, bladder body. It's your duty. Carry it on, Come around to the other wall now. Yes, but just come over to the same place as the rest. Our team uh, and there are some more people approaching. Now, of those approaching, many came to help. Some to risk injury in the rescue effort below ground. A few out of curiosity to pass the dying hours of a Sunday afternoon. Les and I were underground, ready to film at the top of the 50-foot shaft where Eric Luckhurst had fallen. I was nervous. Upmost in my mind was not to get in the way of John the rescue at the any point. Comes up, satisfied that everything is ready for the haul up. First up will be the brother of the injured youth. Even the filming light seemed intrusive. When Eric's brother Brian came up, I noticed him grimace a little and look away. Brian Luckhurst, all in after three hours of anxiety and exposure as he lay beside his brother. The stretcher is guided from above and also by a man below it on the ladder. Eric himself, I suspect, was too overwhelmed by his situation to even notice that we were filming. Now a third member of the Teesside Club is being helped up the big pitch. The worst, it seems, is over. Close ahead lie the three small pitches, which will be easy, and the 500 yards of passage. They tell Eric Luckhurst they will have him out in an hour. Some joker says well before closing time down at the pub, stretcher is successfully brought up the three smaller pitches. At each pitch, men climb into the waterfalls to protect Eric Luckhurst from the spray. Hey, you're all right. Yeah, I've been. 
It is taking a little longer than expected. Everyone, in fact, has underrated the difficulty of those 500 yards of twisting passage. Easy for a man on foot, desperately difficult for the movement of a six-foot stretcher. The rescue was taking a lot longer and proving more difficult than anyone had predicted. The difficulty of the convoluted passage meant that things were moving slowly. I could find my camera positions and stay out of the way. At the same time, the filming lights seemed to even be a help. But the effort is beginning to exhaust one rescue team after another. Now they are in a rift 20 feet high. Men climb to the roof. High or low, they must find the widest part of the passage to maneuver the stretcher through, foot by foot. Will you please pass the message to Settle to call out the happy wanderers? Uh, they are up at the hostel at Bray de Garth. Over. Roger, call one. Will do. Eric Luckhurst has suffered. He complains of difficulty in breathing. The stretcher is disintegrating under the strain and they are still only halfway out. Having shot only three 100 foot rolls of film, seven and a half minutes in all, our filming light batteries were finished. Les and I put lights and camera on a ledge and joined in to help man handle the stretcher. But it was too late for any doctor. Eric Luckhurst was dead. The time was 9.50. We were some of the last to come out of the cave. We got him up to the top of this pitch. The 50 foot pitch. Yeah, the foot where he had fallen. And he didn't seem too bad at all. He was, no. you know, he was quite uh, reasonable, healthy, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think everybody thought, oh, it was a fairly easy job getting him out. He was uh, talking to us. He was aware of what was going on. And um, everybody yeah. thought just a couple of broken ribs, a couple of hours getting out. You know, yeah. Down after and later on, it was after we'd got him to the first section of passage, we got him into a bit of a chamber, and it was the first time anybody thought anything about him um, really e ever dying or anything like well, that. Well, I don't know. I don't think anybody at that point thought anything about him. I don't think well, it's he, first he was time certainly getting weaker. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's the first time anybody thought there was anything wrong with, wrong with him serious, because he, he was complaining about his breathing. 
and I think it's one yeah, thing that made me think a bit. It's still very cheerful, isn't it? it was in yeah. Norway. But um, then we had to get him through this really tight section of passage. He was stuck up in the roof in the stretcher. And then at the end of this, he had to be brought down into the floor where it was wider again. It's really tight, it's just and it really is tight. To do. He was complaining all the time, even then, about his helmet falling off because uh, as we had him tipped upside down. And um, they got him down into the bottom of this passage. And then I think everybody was more or less taken by surprise. He just quietly, his head killed over and he died. Eric Luckhurst died, the coroner decided four days later, from internal injuries caused by his fall. The coroner was convinced that the agreed signal tugs on the lifeline were not given before Eric started to climb, and that when he fell, the line was slack. A pathologist's evidence showed that Eric had almost made it to the top of the 55-foot pitch when he slipped. He could only possibly have been saved, the pathologist said, if he had been in a fully equipped operating theatre within an hour of hitting the pitch bottom. Less time, in fact, than it took for the first alarm call to reach Sergeant Crookshank. The BBC had said that if there was a death involved, they would not use it. Now, having seen the dramatic footage, they changed their mind. I was absolutely aware of being responsible for filming this unfortunate young caver's dying hours. And now I had almost no control. In his own way, I suspect Don Howarth was also almost over-aware of the sensitivity of our situation. I felt that he was being unnecessarily evasive as a result. As we filmed some of the additional reconstruction surface shots, he was implying to the cave rescue team that the sunset film would just be a small part of the finished film, which I knew well was not the case. Things came to a head when Don stopped Brian Luckhurst in the street on his way home from work in Middlesbrough and wanted to interview him, which Brian refused. I thought it was wrong, and that night, as a result, we had a big argument. Eric Luckhurst's mother asked if she could stop the BBC from showing the film. Don said no, because it was film of a real event. It was not altogether true the BBC's wishes, I later went and knocked on her door and explained my part in the film. She was fine. I finished up having a beer in the pub with Brian Luckhurst. I had no part in the editing. I was consequently very anxious about the outcome. It was transmitted on the 8th of February 1968. I have to say that Don Howarth had done a great job. The film was dramatic, but fair and balanced. It got an enormous audience. The press, as we might have guessed for such an emotive subject, was mixed. My own feelings were that the film showed graphically that with an experience how easily a relatively straightforward caving trip could go wrong. It also had a great impact on me. Within months, I had left the BBC with the intention of making films about the more positive aspects of caving. <laughs>